You know, there's nothing like being behind the scenes, like being in the green room. This is like where the magic really happens. And I know you don't care about me. I, I get it. There's no green. There's blue over here. There's red over there. There's no green, but that's okay. We're in the green room. So let me start off by the way we always do, which is asking who is Deborah Debris? But more importantly, what is she up to these days? Talk to us, Deborah. Hey, so good to be here, Shay. I uh, welcome. Say, who is Deborah Debris? I ask myself that question pretty much every morning. Who am I? But mm -hmm. more importantly, and we'll talk about this more tonight. But who do I choose to be today and in this moment? So, if we're looking for a little background cred or whatever on me, um, short story is a uh, uh, Chicago girl originally, live in Scottsdale, Arizona now, but came from a small town about 8,800 people on the southwest side of Chicago. Moved to Arizona. Um, got a job as a receptionist because that's where I belonged because small town girl, high school diploma, that's the job I was supposed to have and uh, ended up with a 25 year uh, career in construction where I went from answering phones to owning and running a $20 million commercial construction company and did it on a high school diploma. Um, but at the same time, I was studying things like neuroscience, brains research, uh, um, quantum physics, uh, behavioral psychology, sports psychology, NLP, hypnosis, you name it, I've studied it. I can talk angels. I can talk synapses of the brain. I can either side because I've studied them both. And uh, so after I left the 25 years in construction, uh, sold my company and started working with business professionals, entrepreneurs, and then eventually with NFL players and pro golfers. Um, and still now work with corporate, uh, corporate America um, internationally. Uh, all around leadership development. So I always say that, uh, you know, I can't hold a job because you know, every time I get really good at something, it's like, okay, so what else can I do? And what? then I often attempt something else that can challenge me a bit. What do you, what do you say to the, the mom that's watching right now, um, the dad, maybe a married couple? They're, they're dualpreneurs. They worked all day long. And, and now they're in working on their business all day long. And they may right. be saying, wow, Shay, she's had a chance to work with some powerful people. Um, what is their mindset, Shay? What is their belief system that, that, that really lets them keep working harder, going further and pushing? So I guess the question I'll be asking is, what's one of the characteristics of a person that has a great mindset? Well, part of it to me is always never being satisfied, happy pleased whenever I've reached a certain goal, but then never really being fully satisfied because uh, once you become satisfied, that's why, you know, in my second book, Average is an Addiction from Mediocre to Millions, is that we are addictive uh, human beings. That's how we are made up. And we get uh, kind of pulled into that addiction of being in the safety and security of where we are. So it's being able to, and again, that's, you know, we'll talk a little bit later in more depth, in depth about um, how do we pull ourselves back out of that addictive behavior of um, feeling safe and feeling secure because there is no growth there. Um, so every day it's like, what can I do new and different today to make my life and the life of the uh, life of the others around me uh, bigger, better, more efficient, more effective, whatever it might be. Mm, I love it. For those folks that are tuning in, like like Marsha Nene that's watching right now, like Beth is out there. What's up, Cal? Thanks for tuning in. Look, how you doing out there? It is always a pleasure. I know we got a show. We're going to kick off in a moment, but I've got to ask her. I'll ask her to take two minutes if, if, at best and share her, what's her big why. You're like, I'm just meeting her, Shay. Like, what is her big why? Why does she get up and do what she does every day? Fair question. So, Deborah, what's well, your big why? I tell you what. Um, this is still, this is going back to Chicago again. When I was 12 years old, five days before Christmas, my 16 year old brother, uh, and there was just he and I, uh, siblings, um, he was killed in a car accident. And it took me almost 18 years before I could say his name without breaking into tears. Aquanet hairspray, for whatever reason, would put me into tears. And I got to the point when I reached into my adulthood of saying, you know, I'm really sick and tired of this. Um, I need to find a solution for it and started studying, um, you know, some of the different sciences and things like that to try to figure out a solution. And as I got into it and started resolving some of my own issues, which we all have them, I don't care if you say you don't, you do, um, <laughs> is that 
I then got hooked on it and said, if I can, if I can not do away with my struggles, but if I can help lessen my struggles and figure out uh, when something is going on with me, I can identify it quicker and shift it faster. I want to teach others to do that. I was born to be a teacher. So to teach, to train, to coach, to consult is what I do. I just now do it at a much higher level as far as the clients that I, I play with because uh, I only work I work with high achievers. There's a certain personality type to a high achiever, and I, I am one. <laughs> <laughs> high achiever. Good or bad, I am one. <laughs> high achiever, for sure. All the high achievers out there. Roosevelt Moore says, I know that feeling. He's watching right now. Yeah. Marsha, we see Kevin G Cage is in the house. Michael, thanks for joining. Look, we've got a show. We've got a show. we got to get started. And don't worry, when we come back, we're going to find out this whole concept jazz about being resilient. I'm going to ask her that question as soon as we come back. We got a show in five. Let's write four. My favorite part. Three, two, one. It's showtime. I made to my mom. I only did this message for one person, and that's my mom. This is for you, mom. Love you. My name is Shay Brown, the happy entrepreneur. Make it a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, check. Shay Brown. My check, my check. All I do is we win, we win, we no matter what. Man. Got money on my mind, Man. I can never Man. get enough. And every time I step Man. up in the field, yeah. everybody yes. hands go up. Yes. Yeah. And they stay there. Well, it's a great day. My name is Shay Brown, the Happy Entrepreneur, and welcome to the Happy Entrepreneur Show, the number one business development and revenue-focused late-night show in the country where we're on a mission, and our mission is to empower, our mission is to inspire, and our mission is to provide you, that's right, you, the entrepreneur, with all of those resources that are necessary to execute that big, 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 big vision you have for the people you were called to serve. And I always like to start off by sharing, I believe you have three visions. Mm -hmm. I believe first you have a vision for yourself. You know, how you wanna look, the clothes you wanna wear, the home you wanna live in, and it takes revenue to purchase those resources. I know, I know. Then there's a second vision I believe you have. You have a vision for your loved ones, the mm -hmm. ones you care the most about. You know, the ones you wanna, the kids. Maybe you wanna send them to a school of your choice. Or, or maybe some of you like writing a check for a cause that you really believe in. And mm -hmm. then others of you, you just want to make a bigger difference in the world. And it takes, well, resources, which means it takes revenue. And okay, okay. And then the third vision I believe you have is you have a vision for those people you were called to serve. Now, you don't have to, have to be a believer, but I love sharing that story because I happen to be a believer. But you can still relate to this. I like to share the story of Noah in the Bible. And, and imagine you're Noah, right? You've been given all the experience. You've been given all the expertise. I mean, you got everything you need. And right before you get started to go on this journey, building that boat, there's a knock at the door. You're like, yo, what's up? Noah, over here, man. Yeah, what's up, man? What's going on? Uh, just want to report there are no hammers in the house. No hammers? No big deal. Cool. No big deal. Ah, there's another knock at the door. Nora, back here. He was up. I see you. Yeah. Uh, there's no people either. No hammer. I might as well com confess there's no people. No, no hammers, no peeper, no nails. Rule number one is don't panic, right? But it's always that third knock at the door. And you're like, I don't have any people, and I have no hammer, and I have no nails. Now they're telling me, what? All the way you in the back. Nora, there's no wood either. Jeez. And maybe that's you. You've got the experience, you've got the expertise, but you've got to be resilient. You've got to change. You've got to push through. And this morning, this evening, this afternoon, the one and only has shown up, Deborah Debris, for one reason and one reason only, and that's to help you go. She's going to hate it when I say this. But not to be average, but to be great. I know you got to be resilient. I know, I know. So what's going on, Deborah? How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. And I will go along with average. That's, that's, you know, my whole thing is that average is an addiction. 
Right, but uh, average is for sissies. I mean, you, okay. Well, that too, that too, <laughs> but I'm a little aware of the the world that we're in right yes, now and a yes. little cautious about some of the things that I say more so than what I used to be. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, average, we, we tend to be as human beings, uh, we tend to go where it's comfortable, which yeah. means we go where it's average. Um, and average is different for all of us. When I worked with NFL players, they're the one percenters in the world of, of, uh, of football. And the minute they leave college and they're big men on campus and they go into the NFL, they are average at best um, because they're now among their peers and the game is so much faster and so much harder and they get all messed up um, oftentimes, which is why they had that freshman year, some of them, especially quarterbacks and stuff, sometimes a sophomore year too, before they actually get good again. Um, and it happens to us in business as well. Anytime we make a shift or a change to something bigger, greater, different than what we were doing before is we can drop back down into that, um, that area of average, average for us because it's more comfortable, it feels safe, it feels secure. And our brain likes us to be in an automatic pattern. It doesn't like change. Our heart likes change. Yeah, it said, said so well. Yeah. Said so well. And I, and I know we're going to get into this this whole resilient thing and growth. All oh, that was <laughs> fancy, smancy words. I love what you put there. But I'm curious. You, you, you have this phrase that I just love that says, don't settle for good enough. Now, now, yeah. now it, it's a phrase you got there. Don't settle yeah. for good enough. Um, why is that front and center? If they go to your page, they'll see it there. And, and why is that, that mantra so important to you? So give us the backstory, if you would, and, and tell us why that's so important to you. Well, and it really goes along with the averages and addiction thing that to me, good enough, um, there are times that good enough is good enough, but not when it comes to things that are important to you. So let's put it this way. If I, um, I'm an average cook at best. I do fine picking out my food. My dog eats food from a bag, so it doesn't matter. That's good enough. If I were a chef in a fancy restaurant, I better be darn good at what I'm doing. Good enough is not enough. So I always look at what areas are affecting you mentally, emotionally, physiologically, um, revenue, respect, um, relationships, and look at those areas that good enough is not enough. And whatever those areas are, and whatever you need to do to up-level your game, that's what we need to look at. That's where we start looking at what are the thoughts, the emotions, and the behaviors that you're having right now and the body sensations that go with them that give us your tell that something is not right. Um, so to me, that's, you know, that's the whole game that, you know, I find it so often, I, I hate to go off on this tangent, but I'm going to go there anyway. Go ahead. My turn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that customer service nowadays, holy man, I can't believe when I find someone who's given good customer service, whether it's not so much in a restaurant anymore because we're not going out like we used to, but yeah. even over the phone or um, you know, over the computer ordering and you have to go to talk to customer service or something, you get somebody who actually listens and resolves an issue first time through. I mean, I do everything I can to praise them or to find a way to praise them because it seems like it's so seldom we can even get good customer service nowadays, which seems like such a simple thing to look for when businesses are scrambling for customers. Mm. Um, so that would be an area that, and I, I don't necessarily blame, though I'm not big on blame anyway, but uh, on the, the person, especially if it's a young person, I go back to management. Why haven't you trained them in a way that represents your business in a way that uh, you want it to be represented and would bring people back in? So in those instances, good enough isn't good enough <laughs> to bring, because there's too many people scrambling for your business. You know, I'm wondering, uh, Sean LeRae Brinkley is watching. She's out there in California right now. Uh, uh, Cindy, I see you. She's down in Texas. I hope you got power. You got power if you're watching. So thanks a lot for tuning in. And all of you who are watching out there, do me a favor. If you're watching right now, uh, you can pay this message for it. Don't worry. I'm going to ask her in a minute. We're going to get this whole resilient thing. But she has this whole <laughs> thing about develop your, your clear edge. It's kind of like one of her things, by the way. So we're going to ask her, you know, what's the challenge of people having a clear edge? 
and then how you develop it. I'm gonna ask you that. But before I do that, you watching at home, you hit the share button. We believe in the giver's economy. The person out gives the competition, out earns the competition. I'll say it again. The person out gives the competition, out earns the competition. So you take a moment, hit that share button, and pay this message forward. And Deborah's okay with that, okay? So you can pay it forward to your Facebook group. You can pay it forward on LinkedIn. You can pay it forward out there. So hit the share button. Hit the watch party button. We really appreciate it. We want to change as many lives as possible, and you're helping us. So thank you so much. All right, Deborah. I start off asking the question, like, clear edge. Like, it says develop your clear edge, but they don't know what clear edge is. So take a moment and talk about what is clear edge. And how yeah, does that I would help? love to, because Clear Edge is actually the name of my company. It's uh, Clear Edge is one word with the E being capitalized. But to me, it goes, it's all about when you get to the edge. Now, the edge is different for each one of us. You know, the edge for me, um, I don't have a picture up here, but behind me on this side, yes. <laughs> I'm mirrored. Yes. You can see that's a 600 horsepower race car. Well, even over to the other side that I drove. Not everybody's going to get into a 600 horsepower race car. I did a great white shark dive uh, in a cage because I'm not stupid. So uh, I went to the Isle de Guadalupe and did three days of great white shark diving. Um, to me, that was my edge. Uh, for someone, it might be picking up the phone and making a sales call. Um, or having a, a tough conversation with someone that you know you need to have that conversation with um, that you haven't had yet. So whatever your edge is, it's what are you going to do when you get to the edge? Because when you're at that edge, you've got to make a choice. You're going to cower back and stay in that safe average space that you've been in? Or are you going to take the leap knowing that uh, based on past experience, that you're going to be okay, whether the results you get are the ones you want, the results that you wanted or not, you at least have that feeling of knowing no matter what happens, you're going to figure out a way to get through it. Um, and to me, it's being able to take that leap when you're at the edge and know that you continue, <clears throat> excuse me, continue to build evidence for yourself that I can do it. I can take the risk and I can make something of it. And even if the information I get back tells me that I ain't doing that again, that I went I went snow skiing once and <laughs> once that tells you something. Um, I had never gone before. All of my friends had. I told them, "You go do your thing. I'll do my thing." When finally got to the point, took a little bunny lesson at the bottom, you know, and went up the hill. Realized I'd never gotten off of a ski lift, never gotten on or off a ski lift, but I did okay with that. But as I started down the hill, I ended up trying to snow plow to slow myself up, didn't work. I started to cut across the mountain to slow myself up. That worked because I ended up falling off my skis and tumbling down and busting a couple of ribs. Well, to me, even though the outcome wasn't what I had hoped for, I paid for it for many weeks afterwards with a lot of pain. Um, but man, I had a story, you know, a story to tell. It's all about experiences. And I knew that, wa that snow skiing wasn't something I particularly wanted to go back and do. I can roller skate, ice skate, used to water ski, no-handed slalom, all those things, loved it. Snow skiing, eh, not so much. But <laughs> alert, I learned, I learned, and brought a lot of lessons back with me. So to me, when you get to that edge, make a choice. Don't him haw around, don't whatever, make a choice. And wow. the better choice is to go for it. Wow. Make a choice, make a choice, make a choice. Everyone do me a favor as you're watching out there right now. Look right below the video. Look right below the video. And just write those words. Make a choice. Hashtag clear edge. It's all one word. Hashtag clear edge. Hashtag clear edge. Now, the topic is being resilient in the midst of change, growth, and uncertainty. If you would, frame the conversation. What's the biggest challenge facing folks today being able to be resilient? in the face in the midst of uncertainty what's the biggest challenge and then on the other side of that what's what's one thing that they can do today so they can make that change so they can have that growth in the midst of uncertainty right so that's yeah so to me resilience that's um it's so important uh in our lives period but then we look at the year we just came through 2020 there's always going to be change in our lives. Thank goodness. Because again, change, the right kind of change when we can 
to pick and choose how we want to move through change is good. That's considered growth. But when we have change that came at us like it did last year, so fast, so uh, all the uncertainty it brought with it, all the, the pain and the agony that we saw, whether, uh, you know, with COVID, with Black Lives Matter, with all the um, uh, just uh, unfairness that was going on in the world and the hatred and, you know, all the, I don't want to get political about things, but all the angst I know that I felt in my body, um, in order to be resilient, first we need to recognize what's going on in ourselves because we each, just like doing a great white shark dive or driving 600 horsepower race car, not for everybody, how we bring on and, and where we store um, all this uncertainty and the change and the angst and stuff that we feel is going to be a little bit different for each one of us. Our experience of what we have gone through, each one of us, my experience, Shay, is not like your experiences last year. There's similarities, and we're both human, which means we both bring it in and we both process it the same way. Mm -hmm. But our experience in life from, uh, from birth till now has been different, which means our experience of this last year is different because we come at it with two different perspectives. But we're still human. And because we're human, we all go through that that um, that need to understand. And yet last year, there was a lot that we, I don't care who we were, the, even the scientists couldn't understand. And we had no control over it, which makes it even worse. Because the one thing we like to do as humans is control things. <laughs> <laughs> and we like to build patterns. Automa our brain wants to build an automatic pattern, pattern that says, okay, if you do it once, if you're going to do it more times than once, I'm going to build an automatic pattern so you don't have to think about it again because you've got other things to think about. So the resiliency comes with starting to recognize who we are, who we have become over our lifetime, and what's the label that we put on the things that we're feeling and how we're experiencing what's going on internally within us. Our thoughts, the emotions, the body sensations, sweaty palms, pets, beating uh, uh, pits, beating heart, um, uh, angst, you know, the stomach, uh, you know, up in knots, the headaches, the tension in the neck, the, the jaw, the whatever it might be we're all going to experience it slightly differently. And when we can notice it and start to understand our own feelings, now we have the, uh, the ability to name it, which means we can now have some resilience with it to get through it. And if we can get through it once, we can get through it again, and then again, and then again. You know, you mentioned earlier, you know, the, um, uh, the story that you had that, you know, I look at, you know, you know, the whole thing about God doesn't put anything more on our plate than what we can deal with. And whether you believe in God or not, I mean, that's everybody's choice. But when we have built, anybody who's lived through last year, made it through, you already are resilient. The question is how much more resilient could you be or do you want to be by building yourself new patterns moving forward to notice when your body is going into that angst and notice it quicker and shift it faster so that you can come out of it even quicker than you have in the past. Suffering is a choice. Pain happens. Suffering is a choice. You know, if you break an arm or a leg, that's painful. The suffering comes from when you think about the what ifs. What if this happened? What if that happened? What if that happens to me? What if I don't get my shot in time? What if somebody I love is in the hospital? What if somebody dies? What if, what if, what if, what if? You know, what if I lose my job? What if, you know, there's all of those things that are happening with, with many of you and all around all of us. So the resilience comes from recognizing, staying present, recognizing our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, and dealing with them here now in the present so that we can bounce back quicker and then stay in that new 
area of thought and feeling that we choose. We're back to that word choice again. We get to choose how we think. We get to choose how we feel. We get to choose our behaviors. That's our choice. We don't often get to choose everything else that's going on around us. Hmm. You know, as I'm listening to you talk, for those folks that are out there, by the way, uh, Mary Elisa says, our brain does what we tell it to do. So very, very powerful. Roosevelt says um, self-recognition. I, 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 will, I will push back on that a little bit. Okay. Um, only because uh, there's a yes and. I'll do it that way. Okay. Our brain is, it's nanoseconds. We cannot control our thoughts and our feelings. We can recognize them and shift them so we can self-manage it. But it happens in such nanoseconds and it's based on, think of your, your brain and your emotional system like there's a, a library of data and, and emotions and information and everything in a book. So something's happened. We'll go back to not to be morbid or anything, but my brother's death. I, my brother's death, I was at home baking cookies um, it was at nighttime. My brother was at a church event. I was at home with my uh, girlfriend breaking cookies. My mom and dad were at a Christmas party, small town, 8,800 people. My mom and dad heard about my brother's death. The minister came over. He was a family friend. So were his kids. Came over, told my parents. They came home and told me. The minute I heard, 12-year-old little girl, it was, it's, it was a slamming of emotions and thoughts and feelings all with the smell of cookies, with having fun, with singing Christmas carols and lights and everything else. Boom. That became a pattern that I started living my life from. Don't have too much fun. Stay in control. Because I was told my brother lost control of the car. It was snowy and, you know, it was a gravel road and stuff. So that became an automatic pattern. So now my brain and my emotional system is in an automatic pattern that I didn't choose. It was all subliminal. It happened like that. It ran my life for quite some time until I started going, I started understanding how mentally, emotionally, and physiologically the triad works within us, mental, emotional, physiological, and then started making some shifts. It doesn't mean that if I see a commercial on TV or something happens and it's um, something that reminds me of my brother or whatever that I can't go into tears in a heartbeat, but the tears will be so momentary because I'll notice it and I'll shift it quicker because that, that momentary um, emotion or memory took me back to the past and I need to be right here in the present. So my thoughts are, that we cannot control our mind, our emotions, we can notice them quicker, we can shift them faster. And when we can name our thoughts and emotions that we're having, we can now choose the ones that we would like to have instead of the ones that we've been having up to this point, because they are, goes back to that automatic default patterns that we have. <laughs> <laughs> I Not love that. it. The default pants. With the people listening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that is said so well. I mean, it, and it's so important. Sometimes people take take that from granted. You know what I mean? And what you're laying out is so important because at the end of the day, for them to be resilient, sometimes it's not just about, oh, let me be resilient. It's about these little nuances. They can really make a difference and right. shift. I guess some people would call it a Tony Robbins like to call it a state of being and your state. Um, but it well, can make a difference. Yeah, your state. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it can make a huge difference. All three. A state is not what you're thinking. Uh, you know, I often, I, I say in my book too, the average is an addiction. I have a chapter. I don't remember what I called it, but it was basically that, um, um, you know, positive thinking is a bunch of BS, you know, because, you can think really positive right until something happens and then you're off your mind and your body and everything is off into the, Oh my God, you know, what's going to go on. Um, so I don't believe in positive self-talk. I believe in positive self-talk that's believed in. That's a whole different ball game. Positive self-talk. If it's just a bunch of, you know, really nice phrases and sayings and things that are going on and little posters around that, are telling you cool things. Um, it's nice and it works well, well, as long as you're positive. But as soon as something comes up that is, you know, fighting against that, 
um, you know, it go, it, everything's, everything changes and not in a good way. But when you believe it now, our emotions are the glue to memory. So when we start to believe it and it becomes an absolute part of us, that's a whole different ball game. Now nobody can shake you off your foundation. Mm. And that's the most important part. Nobody can sh shake you off of your foundation. Right. Only you make that decision. And isn't that so important? There's only two things you possibly can control anyway in life. You control what you're thinking, obviously, and you control your actions. And isn't that good to know that nobody can shift that? Love it. You know, before we move on to the next segment, I, I want you to, to, to take a moment and just share maybe just one more idea uh, for the person out there that is, is expanding comfort zones and some things are just uncomfortable. They're like, OK, changes happen. I, I'm with it. Mm -hmm. But now I'm finding myself doing things that are outside my comfort zone more so than ever. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, a couple months ago, there was a woman that had called in and we took a call and she talked about, look, Shay, and I'm working from home now, full time. Uh, I'm now, I'm a full time wife. I'm a full time mom. I'm now a full time school teacher. Oh, by the way, I'm a full time administrator because I got to turn in their homework. Did I mention to you, Shay, I'm a full time chef. Like I have not cooked this much in a long time and I'm trying to run my business. So I'm yeah. like, got a lot going on. Take a moment in this whole shift and clear folk, clear edge. What do you say to the person that feels like there's a lot going on, but they know they got another gear in them? What would you say to those folks out there listening? Well, part of what I always look at, and we've kind of touched on it a little bit already, is the um, who have you become? Um, and the who you have become is based on all the experiences and things that have gone on in your life, the labels that you put to it, because that's why two children raised in the South, same household with the same experiences come out of the household with two different, totally different ways that they might lead their life. It's because they've labeled things differently. They took it in differently than one child to the other. So part of it becomes looking at who do you choose to be, capital B, capital E? If you look at what's your next goal? Now, goals are simple. You can Google how to you know, set up a goal. That's, that's not difficult. But once you set up a goal, what tends to take people off track is that now we're back to that area of uncertainty because now you're looking at growth. And with growth, with looking at doing something, being something, seeing the world differently and yourself differently than you have in the past, all of a sudden that can rattle your entire base um, because the brain, your brain, all of our brains is always looking to keep us where we are. It's made it set up many, 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 many years ago. It was set up to protect us. And to protect us, it's constantly scanning to see where is there danger? Where is there something new and different? Where may I need to pull back and keep him or her exactly where they are so they don't go out there where there's some level of danger? So what we can do is first get clear on where is that, that place, that goal, that um, uh, desire that you have, get clear on what that is. But then look at who do you need to be in order to have that. So you become, I'll give you an example. When I moved out from um, uh, Chicago area out to Phoenix, mm -hmm. again, small town girl, I was actually a hairdresser. I'd actually been 10 years, I'd held a license back in Chicago doing hair. Wow. Moved out to, well, yeah, I know, it's like, again, can't hold a job. Um, <laughs> Moved out to Phoenix and I, you know, had everything ready for reciprocity and went, nah, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to do something different. Got a job as a receptionist. Yes. You know, that was fantastic. And then this job came along for as a um, construction accountant uh, in our sister company. I answered their phones as well. Well, I wanted the job. I wanted the money. I wanted the prestige. I actually, one of the things I really wanted was a business card because I had never had a business card in my entire life. And that seemed really important to me because everybody that came into my office or into my receptionist desk handed me a business card. But I had two, I had 
two problems. One, I'd never taken an accounting class in my life. And two, I knew nothing about construction, but I wanted the job. There's a whole story about it, and I won't go into the whole story, but I eventually filled out my application, went in and interviewed, um, got the job. God knows why, but I got the job. And then I was sitting there with, now what? Now what in the world am I going to do? Because I have no idea what to do. So from the point that I was a receptionist to even put in my application, I had to going to be in order to even put in my application for that position. And then once I, um, once I got the job, then it was another building, another context. Now, what am I going to do? How am I going to in order to move forward? Mm-hmm. So once I got really good at my new position now, then it was, okay, here we come again. There is another level I wanted to go to. Here comes the fear. With that fear, I had to build another context. So if I want to go up here, and yet fear is is keeping me from getting there, I need to be a new context of who do I need to be up here in order to have the courage to take steps towards this. And no matter what the outcome was, that I had had the courage to take the step or back to the beginning of the conversation again. So as I took that step and had the courage to do it, then uh, confidence started to grow with it. Then I was like, okay, well, here's another goal that I've got, you know, and I was looking at this and going, well, if I can do this, what else can I do? Well, here comes fear again, because now there's newness, there's uncertainty in here. So with that newness, with that fear, I had to have the courage to take the step to come to here. And now I had greater confidence. So it's continuously building that foundation at higher levels, but it's always stair-stepping the way up there. So it's having, having a goal, whatever, I don't care how small the goal is, just one small goal will start building the new pattern of having the fear gaining the courage to step into the fear because you cannot be courageous unless there is fear. Think about that one for a little bit. Um, And then once you take that step, now confidence grows because you're still, you're still here. You still have an opportunity to make another choice and then another one. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm loving it. I mean, I, I know we I'm glad you took time to, to bring that out because this is a very important topic, especially for where we are right now, because now is the time. I mean, now is your time. If you're watching out there right now, hit the share button. If you're watching right now, hit the share button and pay this message forward to your community. Pay this message forward to another entrepreneur, another single mom, single dad, married couple. Someone that's out there is ready to shift right now and go to an entirely different level. You know, as we move to another segment, we have a segment called Today is My January 1st. And for those first that are watching, you're listening, you know what I'm about to do. You can look right below the video. What's up, Erna? You can look right below the video and you can write those words. Today is my January 1st. And for those folks that want to know, what is Shay talking about? I haven't heard this. Well, let me just frame the conversation. Today is my January 1st means that we don't wait for the calendar to say January 1st. We create a January 1st moment anytime we make a decision and that decision can forever change the trajectory of our life. And we probably make about a thousand decisions a day at least, right? So you make a decision that you're going to work out that's a January 1st moment. Are you going to sit back and binge watch and chill out and watch Netflix, right? You make a decision that you're going to eat hamburgers and french fries with some salt, some pepper, some ketchup, hot sauce. My son's got to put hot sauce on everything. Or you decide you're going to go to the refrigerator. You're going to open up the refrigerator. And inside the refrigerator, there's some kale. I know that tastes good, doesn't it? There's some Brussels sprouts. I know it gets better. It gets better. Oh, my gosh. There's even some broccoli. That's a January 1st moment. So it's a do-over. It's a fresh start. It's my past back there. My past no longer equals the future. So my question is, Deborah sitting over there, is when you hear those words, today is my January 1st, what goes to your mind? Hallelujah, first of all. Um, <laughs> but I really, I 100% agree, I 100% agree with you because... You know, it's 
every day you have the opportunity. I look at first thing in the morning, one of the questions I ask myself is, again, goes back to who do I choose to be on that day? Um, but then I also say, what is it I'm going to be grateful for at the end of the day? Because if I can go forward to the end of the day and say, well, I'm going to be grateful for, um, you know, being on, on, on target during my conversations, you know, that I'm just sharp and things are just popping fast, um, that I am going to, uh, you know, finish a particular project and I'm going to be very proud of it. And I'm going, so I'm setting my future now in the moment, first thing in the morning, so that when I get to the end of the day, that I can look back and realize, oh yeah, you did accomplish those things. Now, whether it's a hundred percent or not, it's statistics, you know, statistically, am I, did I do more than I would have if I hadn't set my day? Um, so I love the idea of it's, January 1, first thing in the morning, what am I going to do with it? And what am I going to do about it? And who am I going to be in order to make that all come true? Mm. You know, you probably heard this phrase before. As you talk about that consistency is the key. Consistency is the key. Consistency is the key. But having said that, what do we all struggle with? At least myself. I got two hands raised, by the way. We struggle with consistency. So my question to you is you work with superstars, as you work with leaders, as you work with elite athletes by any stretch of the imagination, what's your secret sauce in order to be consistent? Because life is a series of being on track, and then we're off track. And then we're on track. Well, I know, we're off track. Talk to us, if you would, on about being <laughs> consistent. Well, part of it, it goes back to those default patterns. That's why we're not consistent. This is we, well, we are consistent. We're consistent in doing the things that we say we don't want to do, but we do them anyway. Um, and because of those automatic patterns. So what we can look at is, you know, what am I willing to give up in order to get what I want? And to be very clear on that, such as if somebody's wanting to lose weight, are they willing to give up whatever their favorite food is, or at least half of it, you know, for a yes. while, you know, to to start a new pattern? Are they willing to, um, uh, you know, stop smoking in order to get clean air in their lungs and climb a mountain or for someone, an older person, be able to get down on the floor and play with their grandchildren and get up again and not be winded. Um, you know, so it goes, it's that back and forth. What are you going to give in order to get? And you need to look at both sides of the equation and what you're gaining. Uh, it can go both ways, depending on the person. I've used it both ways with my clients. One is sometimes the fear of what you might lose if you don't make a change is the greater motivator. And sometimes the greater motivator is the pull to what you actually do need or want to have. And when you can make that a moment by moment choice and every day is January one, it makes it easier. Um, plus to break a habit when you can tie the new habit to something you're already doing I'll give you a quick example. I don't know where we're at on time, but I'll give you a quick example. Sure, go um, ahead. I love my I love my coffee in the morning, flavored coffee. Now I make my own and stuff, but um, water is what I really should be drinking. So I make a um, a new rule, a new guideline for myself that says I cannot have my first drink of coffee until I've had at least half of, and I've got a great big huge cup that I use for water. I've had at least half of that before I'm allowed, before I allow myself to have that first drink of coffee. And then I have to have so much of it done before 10 o'clock, before noon. So I'm setting my own guidelines and boundaries based on the rules that I make to myself, make for myself, but I make, and I make them consciously with a reward process in place because that works for me. Um, so it's what will work for you to change one habit, one habit. Again, don't make it so big that it's so overwhelming. Change one thing and celebrate the fact that you've made that one good choice, whatever that good choice is, because the celebration, actually, it's that emotional thing. It starts to lock it in that, oh, the brain and the emotional system goes, oh, you want more of that? Well, I can give you more of that. And it makes it easier to make that next choice. 
Mm, I love it. As we come down the home stretch, there are folks out there as they're listening to you. They may be wondering, you know, Shay, I've got two questions. You know, number one, what type of clients does Deborah even work with these days? And mm. um, number two, how can we best connect with Deborah? Like, what's the best way to connect with her? Now, as she talks about that, if, if you would, I want you listening with, with two ears. One ear listening and say, you know, is, is, is this for me? Like, Am I the one? Am I her assignment? Is she called to work with me? Or, or the other ear that says, who do I know that might be someone that, 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 that she should at least be connected with? So you listen with two ears. You got two ears. Listen with both of them now. <laughs> Over to you if you would. Talk to us. <laughs> are they open? Are they open? Come on. Uh, <laughs> so who do I work with? I work with high achievers. Now, to me, high achievers, when I was a receptionist for the property management development company, I was a high achiever. It's a mindset. It's a not settling. We go back to where, again, where we were at the beginning of the phone, uh, the uh, conversation is not settling. Um, they can be small business owners, um, entrepreneurs. I work with people around the world all the time. I work be even before COVID, either on Skype or over the phone with clients, certainly athletes. But the, the main thing is they must be a high achiever. Because again, that is a certain mindset that somebody says, this is what I want. I don't know quite how to get it. And I could use your support in figuring how, how, how to make that happen. Um, but as you can tell, I have a certain, I am a certain personality type. Um, I'll kick your butt when need be, and I will hold your hand if need be. Um, what I don't do is listen to a lot of excuses. Um, excuses are fine for a while, meaning, um, I've had even NFL players, you know, giving me a song and a dance on the phone for why they weren't able to do something. And I tell them, it's a really nice story. Thanks so much for sharing. It's a bunch of BS, but it's a nice story. So thanks for sharing. Now, what are we going to do about it? Um, and then I'll teach and train in whatever way need be in order to, to help the person help themselves. Um, as far as getting a hold of me, uh, LinkedIn's a good way. You can just go out under my name uh, and hit me up out there. You can go to Deborah at DebraDebris.com. And uh, if you do in the subject line, uh, put Shay Brown, put something um, in there, you know, the comeback champion, you know, anything in there that reminds me of this show. Otherwise, I delete really fast. <laughs> um, my nickname in one organization is Up Yours. Mm -hmm. um, so I always tell people there, I said, just put Up Yours. I'll know that you know me because... <laughs> I, when I was introduced there, um, a gentleman introduced me at the organization. I stood up, looked around the room, and I just went, up yours. Yeah. There's a real nervous laughter. Then I went, up your power, up your performance, and it will up your profit. So everybody kind of calmed down a little bit then, but the nickname stuck. So. Uh, yeah, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Um, take take a moment, if if you would. Um, and we have maybe, maybe two more questions, I know, and we're, as we're coming down the home stretch. But um, one of the questions I like, I love to ask, it's one of my favorite questions, by the way. They're all my favorite questions, obviously. I wouldn't ask them. But I really like this question here. And the question I like to ask is, of, of all the mentors you've had, along mm -hmm. this journey of life and i know you've had so many mentors it's almost a, a unfair question but what's one lesson did you learn from any of your mentors that you would mm -hmm. like to share with us that we can apply in our own life well i'm gonna i'm going to pick two but they're going to be quick one was um a former NFL player that I was interviewing before I went into working with some of the NFL players. And I asked him at the end of our lunch, I said, what would you tell me? You know, what's one thing that you would tell me? And it stuck with me. And he just said, get your name and get your face in the place. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? Get your, get your face in the place. And he said, you've got to keep showing up and showing up and showing up until we're going to trust you because too many people come in and leave. And all, you know, the feeling we get is you just want something from us. So in a business aspect or in friendship, in relationships, get your face in the place and keep showing up for people. Um, the second one is from my dad. My dad was an amazing mentor. He got his GED when I was in, I think, seventh or eighth grade. And yet he was one of the smartest men I ever knew. Um, and he taught me as a little kid, he was a mechanic. Uh, he worked on uh, locomotives when I was younger at, uh, at a company, but he also worked on cars and things. 
but he always taught me, he said, when you're done, like working on a car and he was showing me how to, you know, work on the engine and clean spark plugs and do different things. He said, you always clean up your tools before you put them away. And I think about that whenever I look at, you know, my tools that I use in my business are not, um, you know, mechanical type tools that I, you know, wrenches and things like that. But I always look up to make sure that my tools are, my tools are clean, that I'm clean before I go work with a client so that I know I'm not bringing my own stuff into the conversation with them. So I'd say those were two of my big ones. Ah, man, I love it, man. You're, you know, you're so amazing. You're so incredible. You have a heart to give. You have a certainly a heart to serve. And certainly you serve today. I mean, you've done two things. You've served plus it add value. You served plus add value. So thank you so much on behalf of the Happy Entrepreneur Show for just being here. We certainly appreciate it. Got to have you back. And, you know, the second to last, this is the second to last question. Um, Kim Warren Martin, Dr. Kim Warren Martin connected us. And, yes. You know, it was in the spirit of collaboration. And so this is the second to last question before you have your final comments. But uh, talk about the power of collaboration and, and, and why you still do that in a time when Kim Martin could have been holding anybody she knew close to her. Like, I, I don't want you right. to know my people or my friends. But no, no. She yeah. said, Shay, uh, this person has a message and the platform, the happy entrepreneur. It would benefit them, your community, and it would benefit her community. And she connected us. So talk about the power of collaboration in a time of uncertainty, in a time when some people say the mindset is scarcity versus abundance. Thanks a lot, Dr. Oh, Kim Moore and Martin. We appreciate you, by the way. You're a oh, rock star. Yes, tell me. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I very, very much appreciate her and you as well. Um, and when it comes to collaboration, um, I work with businesses, um, oftentimes small businesses and corporations, uh, C-suite. And one of the things that I teach them is it used to be um, 20th century and before a lot of top-down hierarchical, um, do as I say, I'm the one who's supposed to know it all and don't ask questions, just go do your job. Um, wasn't really the best way to run things then and it absolutely does not work now. Um, we as people, even before COVID and even more so after COVID had re have realized how important we each are to each other. We crave community. Um, and part of community and business means being able to collaborate. Now, keep in mind, collaboration is different than just getting along with each other. So I can tolerate you or I can collaborate with you. That's two different things. I can be nice to you, but really not totally open up and share with you all that my gifts are and, and have the trust in you that you're going to do the same for the benefit of the company, for the benefit of the project, for the benefit of whatever our goal is. I equate it back to when I'm working with um, NFL players, one of the biggest things that they talk about is I don't want to let the team down. As much as we hear about some of the guys that are, you know, the ones that are in the news that aren't as great as we wish that they were, the majority of them are all amazing, wonderful, kind, caring people. And their biggest thing is they want to do their absolute best to be part of the team, to do pull their weight, to work with the rest of the team. Because when a quarterback throws a football downfield, he's throwing it in most cases to an empty space. And he's trusting, he's absolutely trusting that his wide receiver or corner, whoever is going to be there to catch the ball when it gets there. And that's the same thing with collaboration. We have to come together trusting that the other person is going to be there for us in the same way that we're there for them. And that takes some, some skill and some working on in order to get to that point. And it's 100% worth it. Man, powerful. Thanks so much again for being on the Happy Entrepreneur Show. We certainly appreciate you. I want to turn over you. Um, for those folks that are out there, you might be wondering before she gives her final thoughts and closes out, you might be wondering, how can I give her a digital applause? Like, how can I do that? Shay? I'll tell you how you do it. Hit the share button. Like, like hit the watch party button right now. 
pay this message forward to someone else so they can hear exactly what Deborah Debris had to say this evening because she will change your life if you let her. And I'll say it again. She will change your life, not her, but the information she's sharing with you will change your life if you apply it. So once again, thank you so much, Deborah. I want to turn it over to you for your final thoughts, final comments. Tell them once again how they can best connect with you. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you again real soon. Over to you. Thanks a lot for being on the Happy Entrepreneur Show. Thank you, Shay. Well, first of all, my big thanks to you for having me on. It's an honor and a pleasure to be on your show. And happiness show. I mean, oh my gosh, we need this so much right now in our world. Thank you to everybody who is listening and who's sharing in that because, uh, again, the more we can spread this type of energy around the world, the better off we're all going to be. Um, final thoughts really go down to something I mentioned a little bit earlier is find one thing, just one thing to challenge yourself with. Because that one thing will grow. Make a choice of understanding who do you want to be. What's, what, how is that important to you? Draw it out. Do a mind map or write it out or however you choose to do it. Um, who is it that you choose to be? What are the behaviors that go with that? What are the thoughts that go with that? And what are the emotions? And once you start putting that all together, then every morning is a January. Every moment is January 1. Because moment to moment, you can choose what would I be thinking right now? How would I be feeling right now? What behaviors would I be having right now in order to make that goal, that one thing happen? And then do that. So thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you once again. And for all you folks that are watching right out there, I want you to know that you're amazing. We appreciate every single one of you. You're incredible. And as you listen, I know that you got greatness inside you. I know for you, the best is still yet to come. And today is your January 1st. Why? You've got the clear edge. You've got the advantage. Today is your January 1st. Why, Shay? Because you can grow in the midst of uncertainty and you can still have the resilience that you need to get to an entirely different level. Mediocrity is an addiction. Is that right? Did I get it right? Average is an addiction. I'm sorry, yes. right. Average. That's okay, AA. it's like mediocrity. It's the, no, it's the AA, not like the AA. <laughs> Average is an addiction. Well, and it doesn't have to apply to, say, to you. You have to have an AA meeting every once in a while. That's an attitude. <laughs> that's an attitude adjustment. So. <laughs> it is. Indeed, it is. I love it. I love it. I love it. So would you, if you're out there right now, put your sunglasses on. The future is bright and the best is still yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. With that being said, my name for those folks that are curious is Shay Brown, the happy entrepreneur. Make it a great day, everyone. And I promise you from the bottom of my heart, we'll make some good things happen. We connect again next time. Remember this as we close. Time is long. Life, on the other hand, is very, very short. So you got to live in the moment and you got to make it count. God bless me. Wish you success. Thanks a lot. We appreciate you. We'll see you later. We're out of here, everyone. Peace. I made to my mom. I only did this message for one person, and that's my mom. This is for you, mom. Love you. My name is Shay Brown, the happy entrepreneur. Make it a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Shay Brown. My check, my check. All I do is we win, we win, no matter what. Got money on my mind, I can never get enough. And every time I step up in the field, everybody has to work. Yes. Yeah. And they stay there. Thank you, thank you, Captain.